<clears throat> Good afternoon and most welcome to H752. We are currently recording her at the little local library uh, about 70 kilometers from Vorgorda. I think that would make something like 30. From Gothenburg. From Gothenburg, yes. It's more like 70 centimeters from Vorgorda because we are smack in Vorgorda. But it's 70 kilometers from Gothenburg, and that would make something like 35 miles if we're using the imperial system. And one, one's mentioning imperial system and the continental system. Today we are going to talk about Wittgenstein. And since it was a while we spoke about Wittgenstein, I decided to call it Wittgenstein Revisited. Uh, it's a bit of an uh, uh, association to Brightset's Revisited, which was used to be very popular during Christmas time to broadcast. It's an excellent drama, and uh, Oxford and Cambridge are participating in this drama. And these ideas that Wittgenstein had about language started in those places. And what I will talk about is misuse in language. That's a tough word, and I've been handling this word misuse for ages. And there is different understandings of the whole thing. And I will make a tryout here to compare uh, Wittgenstein to one of Wittgenstein's interpreter and see the difference. And this is one of the best interpreters, I would say. Sometimes it's good to have a good one, sometimes it's actually much better to have a bad one. This is one of the better ones, but there's still some not correctness in what he says. And somewhere in between there, we can further the knowledge of Wittgenstein. Uh, and I think uh, it goes without saying to try to understand Wittgenstein head on. It's a little bit like smacking your head against the wall. It's bound to give you a headache and it could take some time before you get the courage to return to Wittgenstein after such a thing. You feel dizzy and you're not grasping. The thing is, it cannot be grasped in one go. It needs to take time. One could say a little bit like Merleau-Ponty, it needs to be embodied. And it would take some time before your body becomes accustomed to this different sort of thinking. And one of these important words here I already mentioned is understanding. We speak about understanding Wittgenstein. And understanding is one of those words that are hugely misused today. It seems to have a special role that goes beyond its proper use. Actually, understanding seems to be possible to apply to everything in the world. And this is a grave misuse. Actually, the misuse is so grave, it's easy to see. And that is very important. My gut feeling, of course, when I hear this, that everything could be explained, uh, is absolute no from Wittgenstein's side. And the easy way of explaining that, I'll go into the tough later, the easy one is that language more or less equals life world. So if we call this life world, everything we do, everything in the world, language will be as big as the life world. And since the life world contains things I don't know, I will never ever be able to understand all of language. I do, for instance, I do nothing about uh, knitting <laughs> also the related knotting 
I know a little bit about knotting, but I don't know the expression knot even. And to be able to understand knotting, I need to practice knotting. And most of the expressions within knotting, I don't know exactly what they are. But somebody could tell me, I could ask Callum, what is this term? And he said, that term is related to knotting. What would I understand that? I would understand only that a certain term is related to the activity of knotting. Would I know the use of the word? To some little extent in conversation. But I would not know the, uh, uh, the meaning of the term Robansknot. And it will come cases when I would not use it correctly. And here I hear some word of criticism come from the audience somewhere. Somebody's raising his hand. But how do you make a line? between reality and language because which is the most pertinent or correct way or easy way of doing if you are in a situation and somebody asks you to make a knot and says make a robot's knot and then you can say I don't know what it means According to Wittgenstein, that would be correct. But in daily speak, you would say, I know what the term means, but I don't know how to do it. Isn't that interesting? We seem to have a problem here between where does language stops and reality stops. And yes, I think you have a point there whoever raised their hand, but Wittgenstein doesn't then answer this question. And I would guess that Wittgenstein, I think that even would have been an educated guest, he would say that that's not a relevant question. Because in some specific cases within it would be correct to say those things. I know what the word means, but I don't know how to do it, or how to buy it, or how to look for it, or uh, how to order it. But that is still a limited use within the whole language game. Don't think that goes for everything. So you can use the word, for instance, Closet in Swedish, and when somebody uh, asks you, where, uh, where is the closet? Well, I know what the word means, but I don't know exactly what it is. You get my drift. You need to specify here, because here it's very difficult that the idea of a difference between world and language enters. In some cases, like the case I mentioned, it could be perceived that there is a difference between word and language. You don't know all the knots, somebody needs to explain it to you, and it would be absolutely correct on you to say, well, I know the term, but I don't know how to do it. But you cannot generalize that to cover everything of language. And you see here, the traps are everywhere. It's like a quagmire. You can always step into a hole. That's why uh, learning philosophical investigations, the brown book, the blue book, or any one of those, it's impossible not to misunderstand because misunderstanding is part of the process. It's nothing to shame or anything like that. That's the only way you can understand by misunderstanding. It would be corrected but only use will correct you. And when I say use, it's use in this Skynian term. And that equals more getting older and do things in your life. Get on with your life. Have fun. Have a glass of wine. Go for a trip to the country. All those things are part of use. Use is 
You don't sit down at the table and say, I'm going to use language now for one hour and ten minutes. No, <laughs> that's not what he means. Use is living your life. That's all you have to do. Well, all. So, well, interesting. That was a very interesting remark of you. Uh, it is difficult, but I have stranded into those holes many times. And everybody, everyone is bound to do that. It wouldn't either be correct to say, to be very, very specific, it wouldn't be correct to say that there is no difference between language and world. That is not correct either. And it doesn't lie in between. The cases are different. And you need use to really understand it. It doesn't lend itself to easy understanding. And here I come I, here I come to the other word I want to mention today, and that's explain. Another word except for understanding that's very, very <laughs> misused today. I would say even worse. And that's the word explain. You hear it way too frequent. It's not a word that we should be used frequent in language. And historically, it has not. That's information provided by one of the experts of his Wittgenstein, uh, Henrik von Richt. That's a very good pointer to some words that has sort of exploded the last years. And explaining is one of those. Well, open a newspaper and there would be uh, maybe the nuclear disaster of Fukuyama and then you will have a little square somewhere and here it says explanation of nuclear reactor. People will read that and they can sit at the coffee shop later and one can talk to the other. Well, I, I read the article about the nuclear disaster in Fukuyama but I didn't really get that square that the newspaper was uh, putting into the, new, into the article. Uh, Lotta, could you please explain me that square? Yes, yes, uh, Busa, I can do it, explain to you. I, I understood the square. Now the alarm bells should be go on, going off all over the place. Of course not even the journalists know what a nuclear reactor is. Very few people in the whole of Sweden knows what a nuclear reactor is. Here, we are not even close to the case of the knots. We are way far. We are way far. No, here is not adequate to put the question, what is a nuclear reactor? Like, I know what the term is being used, but I don't know exactly what it is. I, I can, without a doubt here, say it's, it's not a, never a proper question. There will be maybe one case in the world every year. Two new, no, there wouldn't be any case. That case would not exist in the world, I would say. I was trying to think one up, maybe two nuclear scientists meeting each other, but not even in that case it would be an apt question to say, I know what a nuclear reactor if, uh, when the word is being used, but I don't know exactly what it is. If you ask that question, he wouldn't be a nuclear scientist. Yes or no? Yes. So, these things are very damaging to language, I would say, these information corners. And the reason they say is, this is my lucky guess. This, this is not supported by any scientist or any philosopher. My guess would be that that's the educational system. The educational system just want to sort of shower you with the information. And thank you, education system. But what it actually does in the end is confusing the terms. And once you got the terms confused, you're doomed. It's very hard to get back from that. And uh, I mentioned already in Jutta Bershgatan that the civil defense, civil försvaret, in different countries always uses correct information to confuse the enemy. Correct information at the wrong level is, is much more damaging than uh, falsity, much more damaging. Uh, only the truth can hurt you. Uh, falsehood hardly ever does any harm. 
And that goes at the, uh, against the grain of what people usually think. Remember now, we are in the epoch, the era, well, it's, I think it's finishing off, but uh, fake news has been going on for 10, 15 years now. I think it's disappearing now, but it's rather horrible. It's nothing bad with fake news. Fake news tells you don't listen to the news too much. And if you don't understand, all news is fake in some category. Who, who is the journalist who knows these things? That journalist would not be working as a journalist. He will be working at a nuclear power plant, would earn much more money, and he could get uh, like uh, much more credit than a journalist. And the same thing goes for an educator. He thinks he gains uh, uh, good grades or appreciation by pretending to know these things. He doesn't. So this is a very, very difficult thing. And we need to understand that words are use. Everything is used in the world. And that is not something that puts down language. That actually is a celebration of language. Because Wittgenstein meant that we are destroying language by this tendency. We're making it misused. We mistreat it like a, a coat we don't want to have anymore, a coat with holes in. We use it in the way that uh, suits us at, at the moment, and we don't care if we get misunderstood. That tendency I will get back to in the eyes of dear old Paul Fire Oven. There are, of course, places where the word explain is completely uh, apt. Of course, in this notting example, when the person asks, oh, I know what the Robans Knuff is, but I don't know how to put it. And then the person would say, probably he would actually say, let me show you. But for some reason, they are on the phone and there is a rush so the other person will say, I will explain it to you. And he assumes the other person has that great knowledge of knotting that he will actually be able to perform one. He needs to know other knots. You can't start with one knot, you need to know a few knots before. This knot is a bit more complicated. Wow. This misunderstanding also creates the hallucination of there being a difference in language between extension and intention. Because, listen to this, if you don't know what a nuclear reactor is, you can say, I have the intention of, I got the intention of nuclear reactor. But I, I don't have the knowledge. They have like a free part division. And uh, intention and extension are actually disturbances within an individual. A person that thinks he has intention and extension is a little bit uh, like a person who having a sweaty forehead. And you go to that person, you feel his forehead, and you say, you've you got a fever. There are symptoms of something not being completely working well. But I would say some words are worse than others. And explaining and understanding in these days, especially since Wittgenstein has sadly not been with us for uh, almost 70 years now, they have turned up now and they are playing out their games even uh, more than they used to be. And what actually happens if you go into the education system, you get showered with information about nuclear reactors, the event of the 30 years world war, war uh, the culture of uh, Zambia, 
or uh, what they eat in Florida at night time at 12 o'clock. All those things will, the information will, will not hurt you, but it will actually damage your sense of what the properly used for words are. And I have to give you an example here how bad that is. It's actually exactly the same as if you are a mechanic and you learn how to treat a motor engine at the school and you don't know how to treat the cylinders. The cylinders are the ones coming up and down, giving the force to the engine. And then you will open your own workshop and you will have customers and we try to fix an engine. Since you don't know how to do that properly, what will happen? You will damage the engine if you don't know how to do it properly because there is no leeway there. If you do something a little bit wrong, one millimeter I think is enough, you will, you will damage everything. And it doesn't mean it doesn't it doesn't matter if it's one millimeter to the left, one millimeter to the right. That doesn't matter because you probably don't even know if it's to the right or to the left. You just make a general mistake, a mistake that's actually caused because you don't understand what it means to understand something, to do something. You are looking for doing something. You need to be able to do this, and this is a rather good example because this is very common. There's a, a lot of mechanics that damage engines because they don't know about cylinders. And the same actually goes for dentistry. There's a lot of dentists that hurt teeth because they don't know what is, for instance, pulpa, something or other, the exact working of the pulpa, how far it goes, that it doesn't give any pain when it's dead, and so forth and so forth. So you see, you need to know those things. And if you are showered by information by the school system, you will get accustomed to wrong use. And in the end, you won't understand what it is to actually understand something. And that's really bad. You will be using your words without understanding. And you think also that you can get away with it. That people won't hear that you don't use the words correctly. They will, trust me. You cannot get away with misuse. Language is not that generous. We, we, I think we actually uh, feel that today. We were looking at a book the other day, which is really funny. It's called uh, Paper Ducks. I don't know the equivalence in the, in, the, in the English language, but it's mistakes from newspapers. And those mistakes are not ordinary uh, mistakes. They're not printing errors. But it's a journalist, usually, who didn't, who thought that language was sort of forgiving, that you could say things that you didn't really exactly meant or correct, but then you can say in the, end to, uh, in, in the end to the director or to somebody else, well, I know what I meant and I hope the other ones do. No, language doesn't work that way. The examples in the book, it's very easy because they are funny. It's very easy to, in most cases, that's 70% of the cases, to guess what the person actually meant. But the non-funny ones are more problematic because if you don't even know it's something wrong, however would you question it? You wouldn't. And you would, be, by the text, be put into the wrong direction. Trust me, I've been proofreading texts for newspapers for five years, and that's horrible. It's hard. And I noticed during those five years, it's hardly anything, it went down like this from the, the, the point of view of a journalist. Of course, spelling, much better today than it ever was, thanks to the spelling programs, grammar, it wasn't half bad and actually got better during these five years. Uh, correct sentence forming, mm -mm -mm. but when it comes to use certain 
technological, not so common words in a proper way. It got much worse. And it was often a problem with reference. I would actually love to have that book now. I could read you some examples. But they are all examples of misuse. Funny though, but trust me, there will be at least 70% more that are horrible and will distort everything. I could actually give you an example. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, it was a debating article about the boats going from Gothenburg. We are circa 70% uh, kilometers from Gothenburg now. But we have two boat lines. We have one that's heading for just about south from Gothenburg, and the other one going westward from Gothenburg. The one going south, the people going on that ferry, they get compensation for their traveling, but the one going westwards, they didn't get any compensation for their traveling. And the newspaper said it was a big storm and why is it so unjust when the people going south they got compensation but the ones going westwards did not go with any compensation well the reason is the journalist doesn't know the proper use of the words boat going by boat and those things and people think those are simple words Everybody knows that. No. By going by a boat, if you don't have a boat yourself and you haven't been traveling with it, you don't know the use of these words. So what was the problem? Well, actually it's not that difficult. If you have a boat and if you go by boat. But to explain is going to be much harder. I'm going to give it a try. This is not something that should be explained. But look here, we call it Sweden, and this is Gothenburg, this is going south, this is going west. Very schematic. And you would think, well, the storm is here, it should affect both passengers in the equal amount. And if you have a boat, you will know that, and if you don't, you don't know that. You see the problem? And now what we try to explain. It's very hard to explain because you need to do it. This boat is going this way. It's going with the stir first. The waves will make it go up and down and up and down. Here, the waves come from this direction, going into the side of the boat. And that is much worse. You can see the boat is actually built to go through the waves. But if you get the waves on the sides, that's disastrous. It's horrible. I experienced it once. And that makes the whole boat goes in a very, go in a very funny way. And you get sick very soon. I usually get sick within five minutes if that happens. It's poor torture. So it has to do with direction. And this cannot be explained easily. You need to own a boat and go by boat. And this is not rather complicated. It gets more complicated. And of course you come to this. You come to political relationship in the world. The Middle East situation. I can open a newspaper and there's somebody from Dagens Nyhet. They're living in Stockholm and he understands what happens in the Middle East. There's no chance in hell. That could never happen. And you say, maybe he can, he can make you lucky. Yes, there's no such thing like a lucky guess. You can't guess a whole article on other relationships. It's way too much factors. So we are overwhelmed by horrible information, and it's usually completely correct. It's not false. This is not false either. Well, it's to some extent, it's actually false. You can have a sailor to say that's not actually correct, but to prove this to be wrong in language, it takes, it takes a lawyer. 
And if I say a lawyer can prove that, you know lawyers can prove everything. <laughs> lawyers in that case are a bit horrible. Uh, what would you call uh, 10,000 10, lawyers at the bottom of the sea? Drunk. A good start. <laughs> oh. There's good reasons for uh, being a lawyer is a bit scary because they can prove everything. Well, that also has something to do with explanation and understanding. And that's why it's so important if you commit some sort of crime to have a well-paid lawyer because there's no there's no judge in the world who could see through explanations he can't capture that's that's just impossible so it all comes down to which lawyer you have especially if your case is not clear as crystal so what i'm trying to do here and I will not compare myself to Wittgenstein, but I'm trying to explain the inexplainable. These things are things that shouldn't be possible to explain. Let me get into fire oven here. Fire oven is one of the interpreters of Wittgenstein. And he writes in a, in a more uh, obvious way. And he would call, he would give this a name, he would give it a, an explanation that's contrary to what Wittgenstein would have do, done, but it would still be a first step for us to understand. After we had the use of Feyerabend or von Richt or anybody else, we can leave them and then we can go better into the project. Uh, Feyerabend, he does have some points, there's no uh, doubt about that. But if you start misusing this, what happens? Well, Feyerabend says we get in the end uh, established language type that is misused. Uh, it's a stereotype of language that hinders thought. It disguises nonsense as self-evident truth or profundities. Further, according to Feyerabend, it serves as a civilized mask for inhumanity. Uh, and this is, of course, a very damning critique coming from Feyerabend, but it has good reasons. This is almost in the same alley as uh, Alan Bloom. I said it right now. Alan Bloom. Alan Bloom, yeah. Thank God for that. Finally correct. Alan Bloom, he criticized the educational system. It's going down on its knee. Fire Urban is saying more or less the same thing. The development of a language that is not proper use. Uh, it's crooked, it's dishonest, it's lying, it's deception, it's pretense, and it's utterly and horribly uh, superficial. And I agree to some extent, I wouldn't put it so hard, but something I would agree to to 100% without a doubt, it's the hor horrific use of scientific jargon. And as this should be, people who are using too much scientific jargon should be burned at the stakes. Literally, I mean, no, no, I don't, I mean, metaphor, scientific jargon. This is something that entered all intellectual discourse the last three, four decades, and is horrendous. It's, of course, all this, it's a misunderstanding, it's a misuse, and every time I hear people using scientific jargon, uh, they don't even understand each other. So you think you can get away with it, you don't. Because as soon as you leave this netted group, and somebody out in society here, you're going to sound really off. And it's going to sound off by the word and the intonation. 
and the thing is people are not aware if you are using words you don't know the meaning of the use of it will actually sound bad because you only get the proper intonation when you have the right use of the word and Wittgenstein noted this and uh, Feyerabend noticed this as well and if you go out leave the group and speak to other people they will note that as well they will know that you're talking from your ass they will know you're not saying anything sensible and it's only very few people who would nod to you and say they understand you so there is no understanding not even within the within the group and the idea in modern scholarly is that they at least they make sense to each other they don't misuse of language cannot be practiced in a way that we still have some understanding you don't have an understanding these people are really off off the parameter of the world they share that and higher oven goes from being very hard in his critique to to becoming horrendous he uh, actually compares some academics to people sitting in a loony bin in the mental hospital and there you can see people well i would i would put it in the milder case i will actually transfer that into a uh, old age place and actually a nice memory i had on my dear old mom and speaking to her neighbor and they were talking to each other all day but they did not really understand what they were saying to each other. But there was still some comfort in the whole thing. This is, without a doubt, a case of academia today. They are sitting and having a rather nice time in some, some aspects. Not as nice as my mum used to have, but a bit cold, chilly. Yeah, it could be actually be quite chilly because it has an effect on your system as well. Uh, misuse of language always goes with misuse of the body. It's impossible not to misuse your body at the same time. And this is not something that Wittgenstein noticed. He said, I can see a misuse of language walk miles away at a distance. Because if you're that off from the world that you misunderstand these things, you don't know what you don't know. That is incredibly bad. Because uh, you will not only be the fool of the day, you will also be destructive to yourself because you need a keen understanding of language. Language is something sacred. It's something valuable. It's, I would say it's the biggest treasure we have. But it's being mishandled like nothing else. This is like they put language into a concentration camp and tries to destroy it. And... Uh, Now to my uh, points of Fire Abend himself. Uh, well, I, ha I have to finish this off. The accusation of inhumanity goes beyond pretense. Deception, crookedness that can be seen in academic life as elsewhere. The familiar carnival of subservience or hypocrisy, goes for politics, I would say, of bootlicking and backstabbing that the competitive nature of the milieu elicits in many of its denizens, spread all over society. This is even a more sinister, sinister aspect. Parabon calls that bestiality. And that's a, behind the level of superficial conformism to the false appearance of collective phantasm. A level of subhuman atomous automism of subservience to the proportions underlying the unsuccessful sublimations. This was actually diagnosed already by Karl Krauss, uh, that was in 1910, the last, last century, and the Dadaists. So language become brute in articulation. Language is so destroyed it doesn't even sound like language and that's the idea of the Dadaist they just pretend to make sounds and these people do the same 
My comment on Feyerabend is that he exaggerates the idea of group activity. He thinks this is a movement within society. And I say it's not. It's, this cannot be spread in that way that Feyerabend thinks. It's not a plague. It's, what could happen is that you, if you associate with people that has a lot of misuse, you start misusing yourself. Possibly. But I, I seriously doubt that. So it's, it's, that is putting it a bit too dark. And putting it a bit too dark could actually send, send the reader into the wrong direction. It doesn't spread by itself. Those people who acquire these habits, they're already off. Of course, they can get healed by a, a Wittgenstein or somebody else, or David or Heidegger. Um, Healment is always within the scope. Uh, as I see, it started before they went into this circle, and there is no general language destroying tendency in society, like the tendency of uh, uh, say that? wearing chinos, as I have a pair of chinos in Christmas, that's very popular now. That's a tendency. Uh, there I agree. They could spread. And there's a lot of people walking around with chinos. Uh, more people will stop walking with chinos. But this is not this is not the spreading tendency. And this is not, I would say, now I'm walking on uh, shallow ground. This is not what uh, Wittgenstein would have said. It's you as an individual who has doomed the misuse. It's not a group activity. It's neither is a actual activity of authority. It happened to be that way that a lot of people in authority speak that way. Maybe there's some explanation, but it's not a group activity. We cannot misuse collectively. Because misusing collectively would actually call for some communal language game. Remember monopoly, 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 or chess for that instance. Language games is for something you play together. This is not played together. This is rather a tendency that's not played, so to speak. Uh, but you see here, taking up fire of it put me a step closer to Wittgenstein. Because I start to think, something is mildly off here at the end of fire of it. And of course I got warning signals uh, when you're using that hard language. That's nothing Wittgenstein will use. Like uh, pointing fingers. Uh, Feyerabend has his own personal reasons for doing that. I know his character by now, and he wants to stir reactions. He wants uh, the masses to go out and protest. Uh, I see his project, but although I agree to 95% what Feyerabend is saying, I don't agree on this. It wouldn't be a good idea to walk out on the street and try to save language. And I would say that was also the idea of Alan Bloom, to make a protest. Maybe he was a bit too conservative, wanting to people to go out to the street with bandrolls and uh, black plagues. But he still wanted to have more articles in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and he think those articles would actually create some sort of intellectual movement, like a smaller movement, not walking around and shouting. But that's, I don't think that's what Wittgenstein meant either. So, but they're still good. So this is not criticism. This is it's a understanding path. And this is helpful. Because without those things being a little bit off, I would never be able to stir in the right direction. And this is, I'm going to use a navigational term here. But in order to get to your destination, you need to know what faults you made. That is what you correct. That's how you get where you want to go. Usually it's not like you take a line and you go that line. You're actually using where you're not on the line. You are using your mistake. And that goes for many things. It actually goes for a lot of uh, things we do with our hands, like painting. Without doing faults, I would never ever be able to paint. 
I start with the faults I make. If I would have painted correctly from the beginning, I would never be able to finish one single painting. And that goes for most of art. There is one slight exception, and that is if you are making a statue out of stone. There, if you take off a little bit too much, then you are a bit, that's problematic. But that's not what uh, great sculptures are doing, actually. They are staying outside the line. They're always staying outside the line. They don't go inside the line. They stay outside the line, then they take off maybe a little too much, but that too much would still be outside the line. So if you have the statue of David here, this is going to be a very crude model of statue of David. And surrounding it, you have the stone. And what the statue maker is taking off a bit like this, but he never goes beyond this line. And this is what we're trying to do here, actually. So even statue making came to be a good example. We make mistakes. And that's the only way of approaching uh, Wittgenstein. There's no correct way of statue making. There's no correct way of Wittgenstein learning. Learning it correct is not, it's not a good way. It's not a good way. It's not a Wittgenstein way. So, free expressions, explanation, uh, understanding, and correctness. And correctness used in the end to sum everything up, to make a knot. Because knotting also was something I mentioned. And correctness is playing a part there as well. What is correctness? Yes, it's a term that's being overused, and here we can actually use it. And I'd say correctness, it's not something you want with Wittgenstein. Yeah, it's horrible. Sorry about the sound disturbance. I say thank you very much, and I wish you a pleasant afternoon.